60-foot racing trimaran Great American, underdog in a race from New York around Cape Horn to San Francisco, was only a week away from the finish line when suddenly there was a mighty crash at the bow of the boat. It's a pretty good day. We're moving along at about 10, 11 knots, uh, 15, 16 knots of breeze, and all of a sudden, crack! I heard a loud whack, and I thought, whoa, we've hit something. Looked in the water to see what, what there was coming along the side of the boat, couldn't see anything, and all of a sudden, whack! Like a clap of uh, thunder, another sound, and before you knew it, there was a jib in the water, and uh, the head stay was flailing madly at the top of the mast. Uh, the head stay on Great American uh, had let go. In the 1850s, when all the world wanted to get to the gold fields of California as fast as possible, the clipper ships raced each other over the 15,000 miles from New York to San Francisco. The fastest ever was Flying Cloud, which twice made the voyage in 89 days. That record stood for 135 years. I'm Peter Rowe, with the story of an attempt to break the oldest record in sailing in this episode of Exploring Under Sail. With the head stay broken, skipper George Kolesnikov suddenly begins to see the record slipping from his grasp. Well, now it's going to be a little more difficult to stay on our current EGA. And it's, it's such a shame because we were just starting to really start piling the miles on in this stretch here. I, I, I think it's still doable. Uh, we can still plug along. We're doing eight and a half knots now. Uh, because it's blowing right at 15. But if it lightens up and gets down to 12 and 8 and 10 degrees, oh man, it's not going to be pleasant. We're going to be losing, we're going to be losing time, we're going to be you know, struggling to make headway. Uh, well, let's not think of that. As, as, we've, as we've done right from day one, uh, and as we proudly said, we, we every day, we make the best of what is given to us. Kimball Livingston sailing reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle, defined some of the reasons for the new interest in the Cape Horn record. The interest that we've seen, say, since 1981, when people started trying to beat the record, has a lot to do with the capability of the new boats and also the activities that have gone on in international sailing elsewhere. Uh, the Atlantic record, the transatlantic record, has been pushed lower and lower and lower until it's very, very difficult to beat that record now. The boats that you're using to come around Cape Horn really became technologically feasible only about 10 years ago. And before that, it would have been useless, really, to even attempt it. You weren't going to beat that 89 mark. By the time George Kolesnikov and crew Steve Pettengill are getting ready to leave in the dead of a New York winter, there have been over 250 challenges on the record. Crack British sailor Che Blythe tries three times. The first time he is dismasted. The second and third he capsizes and loses his boat. There's going to be a, a reception down here for some of the uh, Mulderhall people. With any Californian Michael Kane tries, after unsuccessfully enlisting Beverly Hillbilly Buddy Epson's help in trying to find sponsorship money. Kane, we've had some wonderful uh, comp uh, competitive races, and Mike approached me once because it, uh, he wanted to sail around the Cape Horn, and he was looking uh, for sponsors. I said, why don't you try Forest Lawn? <laughs> With Kane's attempt also ending in disaster, the famous funeral home almost seems an appropriate choice. But people keep trying. Now three boats, 
including one skippered by Florida boat builder Warren Lures, are out on the water, already rounding the horn by the time George and Steve, in the shadow of the classic ship Peking, prepare to set off. It's going to be tough. And it's standing here on the dock in this beautiful sunshine in Manhattan. Uh, it's one thing to sit here and say, we'll put the pedal to the metal and we'll be there in 63 days. It's another thing, uh, what the Lord of the Ocean has in mind for us, we're going to find out over the next two months. Uh, so stay tuned and we'll let you know. I've got uh, two hours, two and a half hours since the tide, till the tide turns. I've still got some legal things to look after. I mean, that's the problem with this whole project. There has been no time yet to enjoy it. It's just stress, 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 rush, rush, rough, be a bluff, push people, push myself, just do it to get it to this point. And here we are, you know, almost a month late. The pressures of preparing, financing, provisioning, and organizing the voyage culminate in a crazy moment of nervous breakdown, minutes before departure. And there are some things that I'm going to leave some people in the lurch about simply because I ran out of time in this last week. And I don't know why, but it's just making me... Oh, God! With that out of his system, the lines are cast off and Great American is on its way, though in a windless New York harbor, not yet looking like a record breaker. Once in the Atlantic, though, the boat is soon barreling along, the fastest sailboat of its kind in America at the time, the Great American's 3,700 square feet of sail can push it at speeds up to 27 knots. But there is no engine aboard, so like the clippers before it, and all other racing sailboats today, when the wind dies, as it must in the broad band of doldrums at the equator, so too does the speed. First sunset I've really wanted to shoot because this is such a pretty one today. Steve and I are talking that if this was cruising, instead of each other, we had a favorite companion with us. This would not be half bad. But in terms of uh, record run to San Francisco, this is really getting to be the pits. We have no sink. Life progresses as Great American inches southward. Here. Dishes are washed. Uh, you just kind of do the dishes here, and then you get a little fresh water, and rinse them, and take them down, and you're ready for another thing. So is hair. And uh, we just kind of, you know, do it. Food is prepared. Fish are caught. OK, watch the retrieving line. It is a barracuda. Nice yeah, not bad. We're going to be so stuffed already. And fish are eaten. We thank you, Mr. Tuna. We thank you, Lord of the Ocean. Let's eat. In the middle of a dark night, Great American collides with a mysterious object. The damage is repaired. Steve discovers seawater seeping into the omelets. Gallons are pumped out, lightening the boat and improving its speed. One of the uh, special treats of navigating across an ocean is that you get to change charts every couple of days or a couple of weeks, depending upon your progress. We've, uh, we're just about done with the east coast of South America, where we started out coming through the doldrums struggling, struggling, and struggling past the bulge, and then we finally got some speed, the 234 miles that we mentioned on day 25. That was in a stretch coming down from Recife, and we're now coming around to the next slant in South America before we head off to Rio de Janeiro, and it's kind of a nice treat to fold up a chart, look at the last one, and indicate that you're switching on to the, uh, the next page and start out with a blank piece put on the next waypoint where you think you should be going after discussing it with Bob Rice, depending upon what's happening with the weather. And that kind of gives us a, we're here, we want to get in that general area. Then it enables us with the help of the satellite navigator and so on to, to steer a course, um, 
there, well, we'll get this there with the greatest efficiency. They see hardly any other boats on the vast stretches of the ocean. But off the Falkland Islands, run through a huge fleet of silent, mysterious Chinese fishing ships. As the wind picks up off Argentina, so great America begins to move ahead of its past and present competitors. By April 20th, it is off Cape Horn, 40 days into the voyage, the fastest passage ever for a sailboat from New York to the Horn. A little bit. There's some gray in the sky over uh, Diego Ramirez and Cape Horn, so uh, uh, I imagine the wind will build up a little bit in the afternoon and we'll get there a little quicker. Lunch today on Cape Horn Day will be a mountain chicken. Chicken, veggies, and whole grain flakes and a delicate curry cream sauce. So we're going to have lunch and then we'll work our watches, you know, three hours on, three hours off during the day. I'm going to spend a little more time with the charts and reading the sailing directions and, and trying to enjoy something out of this day uh, because it's a, it's a, you know, I'm not going to have a day like, it's the first time I've ever been around Cape Horn uh, and doing it in my own boat with my own uh, hands as it were, of, uh, own funds, own efforts uh, is all going to make it worthwhile. Um, and I'm especially reminded of, of the Chichesters and the Knox Johnsons and the Montessiers, my heroes, uh, people that I've read since uh, first started reading about sailing stories uh, 20, 30 years ago. And they all came by here, and when I read about it, I thought, wow, Cape Horn. And uh, here we are, uh, moving along at about eight knots, and we'll be at the Horn. Uh, 17.5 in about seven, eight hours. And a lot of parties laid on. We've got all kinds of special treats uh, which you're gonna have a chance to join us later. But like so many sailors before them, George and Steve find that conditions rapidly deteriorate once they round Cape Horn and head into the Pacific. It was quite remarkable how the somewhat benign nature of the Drake Passage, the relatively flat seas, the relatively light breezes, all came to an end, literally, literally within minutes of our, uh, prior to our arrival at, uh, at Cape Horn last night. Uh, it was almost that somebody had just thrown a switch, drawn a line, uh, and this was now Cape Horn weather, which has changed dramatically. Uh, in minutes uh, from a very pleasant uh, evening sail to a very rugged uh, exercise uh, reefing the main and uh, looking after other things and then of course the, the motion uh, just continually never lets up. Let's not uh, mess with this baby. Uh, let's get the hell out of here as quickly as we can because we don't want any boat problems down here. We don't want any crew problems. We don't want any injuries. Uh, we, we just want to, at seven, eight knots, just keep pushing in the right direction and, and, uh, and get out of here because it's not a hospitable place. It's, it's cold and it's wet and it's windy. And I, I'd like to get out of here uh, so that the anxiety level will drop just a little bit. After rounding Cape Horn, Great American heads south and west towards Antarctica. It is a risky tactical move that will prove decisive in the race to San Francisco. As you can see on the chart for the last week or so that we're ahead of the Christie's child of all boats, a crack crew, high tech boat, Boku Bucks and the thing, a tremendously experienced skipper. She's almost 600 miles that way. And it isn't just the fact that she put it in the Falklands. It's the fact that we've been steady, and down at the Horn, we took a dive off to the south, when, as Bob Rice pointed out, everybody else would have gone north and got boxed against the coast. Uh, under those conditions, uh, I, I, I take some credit, and a lot of it was just sort of an instinctive feeling and some luck, because that's what I gathered we had to do to do it safely and well. Go south and go west. 
After a sudden ocean scattering at sea of the ashes of Steve's favorite dog, he and George decide to strengthen their lead by searching the ship for anything else they can jettison over the side. We have really gone through the boat from the bow to the stern, looking at everything that we could jettison in order to cut down weight to give us that uh, lightness that is the mark of, of, of a performance multi-hull. And uh, we looked at some things that you, you know, otherwise would think that uh, we would certainly not, never consider throwing over. It weighs probably 40, 45 pounds of weight there. It's, of course, wet, so I think we have to jettison the other side. People have been trying to beat this record in modern boats since 1981, but the record really goes back about 135 years to a time when time was more than money, time was life itself, and the clipper ships were coming around the horn for the gold rush, and the fastest boat here made the most money. It was just about that simple at the time. Somewhere between 20, 25,000 voyages were made around Cape Horn from New York to San Francisco. You know, it's quite likely, though, uh, I'm going to be the guy that has captained the ship over this distance faster than anyone else in the history of mankind on Earth. Uh, some, of the, some of the great sea captains from that clipper ship era. Of course, they had different ships and all that, but it was still the sea and the wind and a bunch of men on a boat. So, you know, I, I think when I get to San Francisco, the incredulousness of uh, George Kolesnikov with the help of Steve Pettenfield um, and this great, beautiful boat uh, taking this record, I, I think that's going to sink in. As the boat speeds towards San Francisco, the press, who when he began treated George as a long shot, an underdog, now finally begin to take notice. Assuming now he will make it, the Commodores of the Manhattan Yacht Club fly to the West Coast with the Clipper Challenge Trophy. It's one of the hardest tests in the world for yachtsmen. It combines all conditions, uh, from rounding Cape Horn, which is probably the most difficult area, to sailing in light airs, to an extreme endurance race. There's no other race like it in the world. If, if there weren't relatives and friends and business associates starting to gather in San Francisco, if we were just in a cruising boat, hell, it wouldn't really matter. We'd just hunker down, have a great dinner, and not worry about it, uh, and wait for the wind to change in the, in the morning. But uh, since we are in the record mode, uh, we've got to keep plugging away whether the wind is uh, contrary or not. George's parents? Dry. And the painted and dry. You die out there at sea. Steve's wife doing what you want to do. and other supporters begin arriving in San Francisco. Steve, can I help you? Yes, I'd like to place a call to a vessel at sea, the Great American. For me, the magic of the voyage, the magic spell of it all out here, has been kind of broken by having to start to attend to the shoreside and the San Francisco end of details, the logistics of where we're going to have the boat where we're going to keep it, where we're going to do this, where the PR is, where the reception will be, which hotels people want to know. So I kind of had to look after some of these things, which has broken the spell. And, and most of all, I'm, I'm sorry that I've probably broken the inner voyage, the, the voyage that I was taking within myself, in conversation with the Lord of the Ocean. Really, really a blessing on the, on the eve of my 47th birthday. I have the pure pleasure of sailing on the oceans of the world. It's a, it's a, it, for me, I love it every day. So I wrote somewhere once, uh, you know, this is where I was born to be. The joy of ocean sailing in your own boat. It's, it's got it's to be right up there with, you know, with super sex and, and uh, moments of grace and a few other really peak experiences in life. But then with a crack, a broken headstay threatens the success of the voyage. But the crew jury rigs a replacement and under reduced sail continues to beat north toward the Golden Gate 
with George praying that he and Steve will make it safely to land. As dawn breaks on their 76th day at sea, the fabled golden spires appear before them. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I give you the end of a golden string, wind it only into a ball, and it will lead you into the golden gate built in Jerusalem's wall. Hallelujah indeed. And so, taking four days off Thursday's child's time, and 13 days off flying clouds, Great American sails under the Golden Gate to a tumultuous reception in San Francisco Harbor. For reasons that I can't really remember, and probably there was no significant one thing, I just wanted to sail my own boat across big oceans. Uh, and I've wanted to do this uh, uh, for uh, 30 odd years now. So for me, this project, when I came sailing in through the Golden Gate, like, hallelujah! I mean, a major thing in my life happened. Uh, and uh, I, the fact that it's a record, the oldest record in sailing, is just pure gravy. There's no question about it. I'm the luckiest man on earth. I am the luckiest man alive. Uh, for this, all this to happen to me, the voyage, the voyage, the challenge, the fun, the excitement, the adventure, and then maybe a, a, a all-time record to boot. <laughs> wow. After breaking the record, George Kolesnikov sold Great American to Rich Wilson who then sailed it with Steve Pettengill to try and break the record run from San Francisco to Boston. In a huge storm off Cape Horn, the boat was capsized, the two men rescued, and the boat never seen again. George now lives in Canada, where he is making plans to head south again to explore, more slowly this time, the lonely land at the southern tip of the Americas. What's the best single sailing event in the world? Well, for great competition, big beautiful boats, great winds, wet t-shirts, and the best parties in the Caribbean, the answer is Antigua Sailing Week, the destination of this week's episode of Exploring Under Sail.
Where we dance in a band or relax in the sand. Antigua Sailing Week is probably one of the biggest undertakings that anyone or any group can try to do. It started out with Desmond Nicholson and a bunch of people with I think like six or seven boats the very first year. We're in the 30th year now with a record uh, 250 plus. I met the Where we dance in a band or relax in the sand in Antigua, Antigua. Four, three, one, six. Sunday, April 27th, race one. We sail with Vancouver sailor Chuck Ramsey and the Scottish crew of the Sigma 41 Savitar. Uh, it's a Sigma 41, um, quite an old one, it was built in 1984. Um, it's, uh, it was originally a corporate boat for a, an English brewery, so the director had some great fun with this before it, uh, in the early part of its life. It's a um, cruiser racer. It's a heavy boat, it's, uh, it's a lot better for offshore. It's about 15 knots of breeze to really get it going. the race, Savitar runs into problems when its spinnaker gets out of control, flies away, falls into the water, and drags behind the boat. Easy sailing? Not when you're trying to drag up a thousand pounds of wet kite. But eventually it's aboard, dripping in the cockpit, and we're back in the race. While Savitar's owner and crew delivered their boat themselves from Scotland to Antigua, most of the boats are either delivered by paid crew were chartered in the West Indies for the regatta, with the sailors arriving by air and staying at snazzy island resorts like the St. James Club, Caribbean home of celebrities like Whitney Houston, Robin Leach, and Eric Clapton. If you're looking for peanut butter, low-budget sailing, leave the hardtack in the food locker. This week, we're staying at one of the finest hotels in the world. Antigua Sailing Week began 30 years ago when it was developed by the world's original yacht charter service, now run by the brothers Rodney and Desmond Nicholson. My father was in the Royal Navy uh, during the war, and um, in the latter part of the war, his job was to go looking for billets for landing craft, which he did, but he also found the yacht Mollyhawk on the mud bank 
on the River Dart on the south coast of England. So he, he called the owner and said, um, I'd like to buy your yacht. And the, and the owner said, good God, man, in the middle of the war, you want to buy a yacht? He said, by all means. <laughs> so he bought it. Yeah. On, on the Molly Hawk, my brother was the skipper, I was the mate. And then eventually when we had two yachts, we were both skippers and then we had crew and, you know, it just grew from there. And we met so many nice people chartering the yacht and um, uh, we had a great time. It's been a very exciting business from the beginning. Well, the first naval ship ever recorded in English Harbour was a yacht. And furthermore, it was a charter yacht. That's the amazing thing. There's so many charter yachts here today. It was chartered by the King of England for his governor, the governor of the Leeward Islands. The governor needed to see his islands that he was responsible for, so the king gave him this yacht. 200 years later, the Nicholsons began chartering their yachts, and a few years after that, began what is now one of the world's premier sailing regattas. And then, of course, there were quite a lot of charter skippers at the end of the season. Uh, we all wanted to get together, so sailing week. So we decided we would have a race between here and Guadeloupe, have a night on the town in Guadeloupe, sort of a social affair. And we raced to Guadeloupe and back. And then in, that was in 1960. By 1964, uh, British Airways, British Overseas Airways Corporation, as it's called then, gave us a fantastic silver cup and we vied for that. But then I suddenly said to myself, why do we have to go to Guadeloupe to race? Why don't we race around the coast of Antigua? And now, 30 years later, 4,000 sailors have come to sail with them. Race two. We sail aboard the brand new 77-foot day sailor, Sleigh Ride, with owner Thomas Gosnell and sailing master Tom McLaughlin. All right, well, this boat is called Sleigh Ride, and it's it doesn't quite fit into any category. It's sort of like a unicorn, you know? It's close enough to a horse, but it's not a horse. And the Gosnell family, that have like three generations of sailors, wanted a boat to sail in Nantucket, just as a day sailing boat. So it was designed to go out the harbor, go fast on the reach, and come back in and have a nice lunch. After the race, we returned to raft alongside Sleigh Ride's mothership, the 115-foot Timonier, where the cooks have been working through the morning preparing lunch for us, and where we get an opportunity to view video of the boat's recent cruise, not as expected through the gentle Caribbean, but rather an adventurous yet elegant and stylish rounding of Cape Horn. On the third day of the regatta, we had one of the most exciting times we've ever spent on the water, sailing aboard the old maxi, Matador, now renamed Longhorn, and being campaigned by the U.S. Virgin Islands, America's Cup Syndicate. Third race, it's a, a good opportunity for us to do well because it's uh, going to be a lot of upwind work, and I'm not to take nothing away from you fellas on the foredeck. We have some help back, our Josh is back, and uh, we've got one broken finger there, we've got 
um, David back, and he's got uh, one broken finger, two, or whatever the hell it is. So I hope the rest of you keep your fingers out of where they're not supposed to be. And uh, we want to do uh, as well as we can. Uh, if you've read the thing, there's an X class in uh, the Big Boat class. And if we could beat uh, uh, Kilroy, whatever the name of his boat is, in these three races, which we could do if we put it together, I think, uh, then we would get that, I think we'd get that prize. And, and after all, uh, we're out here to, to win if we can, so let's try hard. But the skipper's hopes for a good race are dashed right at the start when we ah, ran Kielo up high. No clear. Can I clear? I'm clear. I'm clear. Oh, shit. Then the wind blows out the number two Genoa, and the boys in the sewer are forced to winch up a replacement. Problems continue as the spinnaker jams at takedown, and soon both sailcloth and tempers are starting to fray. Get the kite in the boat fast! Fortunately, as the wind blows at 24 knots, we are not the only ones having problems. All right, enough with the sailing for a while. This is Wednesday, which they call Lay Day around here, and I guess that means you're supposed to get wet, and that's what Paul and I are doing diving with John Burke and exploring Antigua underwater. Our dive master is John Burke, a colorful local character who, with the help of an underwater slate, provides entertaining and informative commentary about life on the reef. While anyone can enjoy the excitement of diving with big maritime creatures, such as turtles and sharks, the skill of a good underwater guide like John Burke is in finding and exploring the microactivity that escapes the cursory look of many visitors to the reef. Creatures like the peacock flounder, which carefully tries to camouflage itself against the rock and sand, the black bar soldier fish, which hides in dark overhangs, and the spotted moray, tucked into tiny holes in the coral, are often missed in an over-speedy transit of the coral landscape. It takes patience to find rare reef fish, like the spotted drum, and a guide like Burke to explain activities such as this school of four-eye butterfly fish feeding on the eggs of the damselfish. This Nassau grouper is at a cleaning station, set up as a permanent fixture on the reef by creatures ready to look after the dental and skin afflictions of other fish. The peppermint cleaning shrimp acts as an underwater toothbrush, while the neon goby picks tiny parasites from the scales of the patient grouper.
Back on shore, we take the opportunity to explore some of Antigua's many beaches. 365, they claim, one for every day of the year. Day climaxes with the famous Antigua Sailing Week wet t-shirt contest. Antigua invented this childish, sexist, immature, politically incorrect event. And thankfully, it's still alive and well. Race four, we sail with one of the largest contingents of foreign sailors, a group of skilled Germans who sail on Lake Constance during the summers and Antigua every winter. We are the dream team from the Antigua Sailing Week. All right. Yeah, you feel it? Yeah. Much fun on the races and parties and uh, very good for sailing. On the last day of the regatta, we link up with perhaps the grandest entrant, James Dolan, who this year brings a flotilla of 15 boats with him. A brand new Maxi, Sagamore, the Swan 57 Bravo, and the 73-foot sloop Encore, plus four huge support ships and a bevy of windsurfers, inflatables, and runabouts to ferry the 90-person crew to and from the race course. Sailing aboard Bravo, 
Coming first in class in the final race of the regatta was a fitting climax to a great week of sailing in the strong winds and warm water of Antigua. It's so different to be here and see boats that you read about in magazines, to see boats that you see on the occasional TV show, and be part of it all, to rub shoulders with the crew from Sayonara and have them, you know, sitting at the next table from you is almost like, you know, maybe some of this will rub off. And everybody that comes down here, I think, has a, a, a dream in the back of their mind that maybe they'll just sort of forego everything and say, maybe I'll work as crew for a year and just take the year off and like we always say, we'll sell the dry cleaning business, we don't own one, and, and move to paradise and just try it for a year and see what it does. And that's what this place does to you. There is so much energy and there's so much life and you walk around here and no one is frowning. The whole world is smiling, everything's happy. You're done with the race, you can be beat to death, have problems on the boat and everything, but as soon as the boat's tied up and everything's put away, it's like, it's another day in paradise. How can you go wrong? It's just wonderful. I wouldn't trade this for the world and I'll be back, always.